How good are the Marshall Thundering Herd? It's Locked on Sunbelt. You are Locked on Sunbelt, your daily podcast on the Sunbelt Conference, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to another edition of Lockdown Sunbelt, your team every day. I'm your host, Dave Schultz. We'll be joined momentarily by uh, Luke Creasy, the uh, beat writer for the uh, Huntington Herald Dispatch, and he covers the Marshall Thundering Herd. Marshall off to a tremendous start, already 15 wins, more wins this year than all of last year. They sit atop the Sunbelt standings. They are tied. What were the expectations going in? They were preseason, I think, pick sixth. Uh, they've obviously ex- are exceeding that as of right now. But they're coming off an awful season. What was the turnaround for Dan D'Antoni's team uh, for uh, this year? Seems they're having a fantastic atmosphere there. They sold out last Saturday's ball game against Old Dominion. Uh, and so let's just get into it. Here is uh, Luke Creasy from the hunting from the uh, Huntington, West Virginia Herald Dispatch, joining me on Lockdown Sunbelt. Dave Schultz back with another edition of Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. Uh, thrilled to have Luke Creasy back on with the Herald Dispatch talking Marshall Thundering Herd. Luke, tell us about the Thundering Herd. They were picked about halfway uh, preseason in the Sunbelt, and they've had an outstanding season 15 and four overall, four and two in the Sunbelt. A couple of huge wins at home, including a sellout victory over Old Dominion on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. They've been an exciting team to watch uh, this, this season. And um, you know, I think uh, have surprised a lot of people, maybe everybody but themselves and head coach Dane D'Antoni, um, who uh, has has bragged about how he's uh, kind of known the potential of this squad, um, you know, ever since uh, he saw him this summer. Um, it, it's it, it's a different year, um, you know, uh, not only um, you know, the switching conferences, um, but just a lot of questions surrounding the, the program and the team after last year, lost 21 games. Um, after uh, they got off to a hot start and then uh, lost at one point uh, 10 games in a row and, hmm. and only won four games in conference USA. Um, it really uh, disappointing by all facets. Um, but uh, I think the biggest thing for Marshall this year has just been continuity. Um, they got uh, Andy Taylor and Tavion Kinsey back and those two um, our scoring machines, Tavion Kinsey, I think uh, saw yesterday leads the nation in, in made baskets. Um, has 165 makes this year. Uh, really a dynamic player, and, and w- when he has the ball in his hands, uh, good things tend to happen. And same with Andy Taylor. And they've added a couple, um, you know, a couple freshmen that, that have come in off the bench and contributed defensively. I think the biggest name um, and, big and tallest guy on the team, Micah. Um, Han Logton, um, who has just uh, burst onto the college scene, uh, w- w- one of the top shot blockers in the country, uh, not only in the Sun Belt, but the whole country. And uh, just, uh, you know, a-, a lot of exciting players um, who-, who have kind of sunken into their roles. And uh, when they are on, um, they're hard to beat. All right. So let's backtrack it a little bit. That's interesting. So they had a very disappointing year last year. And yet you said the biggest thing was continuity because a lot of people would question yeah. if you're going to go with continuity after a 21 loss season. There had to be yeah. some sort of discussion or maybe, like you said, the guy in the middle is a difference. What what has been the biggest difference between last year and this year? And even though they got the same guys, I mean, yeah. they're, they're already won 15 ball games. Yeah. Yeah. They, they eclipsed last year's win total. Um, a, a couple games ago, and that doesn't mean anything to, to D'Antoni. But, but I think, you know, w- when you look at, okay, you have the same players um, and, and perhaps even lost some, some key role players after last year. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that the difference is they're playing within their natural positions. Um, I think last year um, th- th- there wasn't that one guy who, who was a spot-up shooter. Everybody was trying to be that guy. And it just wasn't working. They lost close games. They got blown out a few times and um, just really had kind of an identity crisis. And But, uh, you know, coming back this year, they added one guy out of the transfer portal. Um, that was Camden Kerfman, uh, who came over from VMI and uh, really is just uh, that, that one guy that they know can shoot the ball um, consistently. So, um, you know, that has helped um, having that one guy and kind of freeing up 
people to play in their natural positions. Um, you know, Obina and Achille Killen, um, who uh, played high school here locally-ish, uh, about an hour and a half from from Huntington, um, has really, uh, you know, stepped his game up, which has helped. Um, and when you can rotate uh, that big in with a young big like Micah Hen-Logton, um, th- that gives you some, uh, you know, some leeway as far as, um, you know, how many minutes each of those are playing so you can keep fresh guys in there. So, uh, but, you know, as a core, um, you know, th- they returned uh, three, uh, four key contributors from last mm-hmm. year um, mm-hmm. that saw a lot of minutes, but just lost a lot of ball games. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, that disappointment kind of uh, sparked a fire in them over the off season and they've, um, you know, they, they picked up, um, you know, they picked things up, you know, right from the get go have uh, 20 point wins at home over app state. And then, um, you know, you know, be, uh, you know, just came over, uh, beat old dominion in front of a sellout crowd. The environment has really picked up. Um, and I think they feed off of that energy. Yeah. Tell us on how, uh, I mean, they have two of the five leading scores in the nation in fact, or in this conference, actually two. Yeah. Of the top three, with Tavian Kinsey, you said, leading the nation in buckets, uh, over 21 points a game, and Andrew Taylor, almost 19 points a game. How have those two guys meshed? Uh, great. Um, they have chemistry. They've been here together for four years now. Uh, Tavian's a fifth-year guy. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, those two playing together, having seen um, some of the successes that uh, that this team has had, you know, Tavian, of course, um, was on that uh, team that went to the NCAA tournament um, in 2018. He was a freshman that year. But, uh, you know, th- th- they've seen what Marshall basketball can be and uh, have really kind of made it their goal to get back to that. And, um, you know, a-, a fresh start in the Sun Belt, a new conference. Uh, granted, some familiar faces, Southern Miss, Old Dominion, um, you know, c- coming over with them. But, uh They've made it their mission, um, and they're on a mission. And I think uh, that their play reflects that, and their productive, uh, you, you, you know, that their productive minutes on the court um, kind of reflect that mentality. We're talking with Lou Creasy from the Herald Dispatch, locked on Sun Belt, your team every day. All right, so talk about that atmosphere. They actually had a Thursday ball game, uh, which may have been a bigger ball game, but they had sold out the Saturday ball game. Obviously, one's a weekday and one's a weekend. How much? How important is it that? They are selling out uh, their arena because it, it felt like it was a big deal on social media. Um, yeah, yeah. Because they sold it out well before the day. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, you know, th- they had announced Old Dominion as a sellout, I think, a week prior to the game. Mm. Um, and and part of that, you have to keep in mind, um, they did reduce the capacity of the Cam Henderson Center this year. Um, so th- I- if you've never been to a Marshall basketball game, they, they used to be affectionately called the Hurt Heaven Seats. Because you were that high up, right? That's in the funny. arena, you're kind of above the rafters, oh, honestly. Right. Uh, but co- concrete seats uh, that didn't have handrails, so um, not exactly safe. Um, right. You know, especially when you introduce uh, the sale of adult beverages um, at, right. at the arena, uh, which happened. So they closed off those seats. Um, they roped them off, similar to what they did with the football uh, stadium this year. Um, they closed off some of those seats that uh, I think actually reduced the capacity. It was just over 9,000 um, prior to that. They wrote, they tarped all of those off, have uh, nice, uh, pretty banners um, over them now. And what that does is it naturally just brings, um, you know, the people who are buying those cheap seats 30 feet closer to the court. Um, so it creates a really intimate environment. And uh, they didn't raise the cost of those ticket seats. And so you're still selling the tickets. Um, you're just bringing people closer to the action. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Marshall sells out that home game with Old Dominion if they open up the arena to full capacity. Um, I, I don't think that's, uh, you know, in, in the works uh, to reopen that um, capacity. But it's created a nice environment. And people are excited to watch Marshall basketball. Um, you know, they, they love uh, Dane Dane Tony, uh, who, you know, of course, played for the herd for many years, um, is in the Marshall Athletics Hall of Fame um, and, and really does a lot to promote the university. And so, uh, you know, they love him. Uh, they love guys like Tay and, and Andy who have stuck around in, in the age of the transfer portal when it's so common to see guys jump, um, you know, after having successful years. And uh, so it, it, it's the hottest ticket in town. And, uh, you know, the, the, the guys are feeding off that energy 
um, that that's brought. And, uh, you know, they, they drew over 4,300 for a Thursday night game that was played at 9 p.m. because it was moved mm. to ESPN2. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that's impressive. Um, I, I expected maybe 3,000, 3,500. Um, but, but when you're drawing over 4,000 um, uh, on a school night, uh, you're doing something right. Well, I'll tell you that, yeah, because that was on ESPN2, and I didn't realize it was late at night until I was waiting for it to start uh, at the South Alabama game. But even South Alabama had issues when they had Alabama in town the year before, a couple years before, they had uh, sold out the Auburn game, but this game was at 8 p.m., and I'd say it was 90, 95% sold out, but if it was a 7 o'clock ball game, it would have been sold out. And boy, that, you know, you even hear it from administrators because the conference loves it when it's on national TV and that Marshall game was, uh, but at the same time, the administrators are like, Boy, we could sell a few more tickets. Yeah. That was an hour earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think that's still the case. Um, you know, I, I think it would have been a sellout had it been, you know, uh, a seven o'clock tip. I mean, you're talking about a difference of fourteen hundred seats. Sure. Uh, um, so I, I think that's that's you know possible. Um, right. But you know, moving forward, I think there's still that same excitement, especially, um, it, you know, but. Being as the Marshall fan base is, um, a lot of that might depend on how they do this weekend. Um, you know, their their first back to back Sun Belt games uh, on the road. Um, they're at Texas State, at Arkansas State on Thursday and Saturday, respectively. So, um, you know, if they win both of those, come back home at seventeen and four, ha- have a uh, home contest next Thursday night, uh, could be another fun environment there. All right, let's take a time out. We'll come back and we'll hear from Luke Creasy. You're going to have two opposite tempos of uh, two different styles of play when Marshall goes and plays a Texas state, you got the high scoring thundering herd and you got that excellent defensive team that is very methodical uh, playing offense. And that's the Bobcats. Uh, They will not shoot the ball much more before 10 seconds uh, to go on the shot clock. And even at that point in time, they, they don't have a problem winding it uh, down. Meanwhile, let me tell you about a bet online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there. From football to basketball to soccer and esports, we got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, more with the Marshall Thundering Herd beat writer for the Herald Dispatch. Here is Luke Creasy. Well, let's get into that. And we're talking with Luke Creasy from the Herald Dispatch about the Marshall Thundering Herd off to a great start this year, 15 and four, four and two in the Sun Belt. So let's talk about Dan D'Antoni uh, with him and his uh, brother Mike with the up tempo uh, mm-hmm. basketball. They're second in the conference. Uh, ironically enough, behind James Madison, who was like the leading score, scoring team in football. And they're second over, what is it, over 81 points a ball game? Yeah, almost yeah. 82 points uh, a ball game. And now they're going to go up against Texas State. So it's really going to be interesting to see what method works because Texas State plays great defense and they are in no hurry whatsoever to shoot the ball. It'll be interesting to see if Dan D'Antoni does something differently on the last 10 seconds of the shot clock because they don't look to shoot or score yeah. the early, it- early at all. And I think Old Dominion kind of plays the same style. And so, um, you know, Old Dominion's averaging under 69 points a game, too. Um, you know, so they're, they're right there in the bottom of the league in terms of scoring production, but but they make up for that on the defensive end. And I think, uh, you know, that, that has been something that, that Marshall has, um, you know, battled for, for years when they face the Monarchs it is, you know, it, it's such adverse styles. Um, you, when you look at, you know, how these teams are going to play each other and, and Texas state's the same way. So, um, you know, I think the key for that is just, uh, being able to, to read the defense and, and find a way. Um, I think when you look at the old dominion tape, you'll see that, uh, the Monarchs switched up defenses, I don't know, four or five times during the game. They, mm-hmm. they started out on a, in a one, three, one played in a one, two, two, and then a three, two, and then a two, three, and then went back to man. Um, and every time they switched defenses, it took Marshall a couple of possessions to figure it out. Um, you know, they would go on uh, on stretches where they shoot, uh, I don't know, two for seven and then rattle off once they figured out they make four buckets in a row. And then, you know, and th- that's kind of how, um, you know, Marshall managed that uh, against Old Dominion last Saturday. 
Um, now, the, the the downside of that is, you know, that keeps your opponent in the game. Um, Old Dominion, uh, you know, Marshall had an 11-0 run to start the second half, um, then went on a little cold streak. Old Dominion fought right back into the co- contest, um, you know, and then it took another 10-0 run to create that space at the end of that ODU game to, to be comfortable. And uh, so I, I think that's going to be the key. You know, can Marshall replicate that defense uh, that, that Texas State is going to present in practice? I think this being a Thursday game versus Saturday helps mm. that because right. with the Thursday-Saturday turnaround, you got one day to prepare um you know for that and um and that that was a lot of the issue for marshall is they couldn't replicate that stuff in practice um because you know they they weren't um you know they didn't have time so um i i think uh, ha- having a you know four or five day stretch to prepare for that might be beneficial to the herd but uh, they're gonna have to play um you know deep into the shot clock like you mentioned um and they're gonna have to to find ways to turn texas state over and turn those turnovers into points yeah, so let's talk about it on the other side because that Texas State is going to stay in a man-to-man. I don't know how often they change defenses. But what does Marshall do in like the last 10 seconds? It's really hard to say defend for 20 seconds and then defend harder for 10. And Texas State made at least four or five baskets as the clock shock was winding down or at the end of the half. Uh, and so they don't panic, right? They're very used yeah. to it, like, like shooting 3-2-1. Uh, and that's not a problem for them. Uh, at least with South Alabama, I would have liked to see maybe double the ball, right, with like five seconds or just do something a little different. And if you give up a layup or two, but maybe you, you know, get a steal in there as well, just to see a little confusion, uh, just to change things up. And, you know, and the thing is with what you mentioned, you know, there's room for error, a very little room for error with Texas State because they are yeah. not high scoring and they're really good defensively. So if they make a couple of plays at the end of the game, they win. If they don't make a couple of plays, at the end of the game, then the other team wins. Yeah, uh, It'll be interesting to see what Marshall does, not only offensively against a Texas State defense, but what Marshall tries to do against Texas State defensively as that shot clock is winding down again and again and again. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to uh, see Dane Toney uh, bring in some sort of a press, um, you know, to, to, to limit how much half-court defense they have to play. Um, you, you know, All if right. you bring in a press and it takes them – I don't know, six, seven seconds state across half court, right. you know, then you're looking at, okay, well, I don't have to defend, you know, the full shot clock, um, you know, right. and then that, that gives the defense time to sink into to what they want to do. Um, Marshall's defense uh, is long um, and, mm-hmm. and they're active hands. And so I think you're going to see a lot of that, but um, you know, Marshall's going to try and create that press to create the turnovers because Marshall plays its best ball out in transition. Um, th- that's been the way it's always been under Dane Dane Tony, and and that's uh, you know an important piece of what they do, uh, not only offensively or defensively, but offensively as well, it is creating those turnovers to force other teams to be like, okay, well we need to speed it up now uh, because you know we can't make up these points because we don't have the possession because we always play so slow, and so I, I think uh, you're going to see a, a lot of the active defense up front early in the possession, and then you know as that shot clock runs down. Uh, Marshall's probably just going to settle in. I don't know how aggressive they'll be late in the shot clock, um, you know, because they have confidence in, in their guys underneath to to be able to be big enough to to block shots and, and you know and close off some of those lanes. So um, you know, I think it, it, it'll be an interesting dynamic. But uh, you know, I, I don't think Marshall is the kind of team you know, kind of like you were talking about Texas State. They don't panic late in the shot clock offensively. Yeah. Marshall's not going to do that defensively either. Mm. All right, let's wrap things up with Luke Creasy from the Herald Dispatch talking Marshall Thundering Herd. Uh, We do have some teams at the top. you have got six teams. Uh, There are four and two in the conference. A lot of them are very good. And then very exciting about ULM, actually. They, they, you know, the half their wins are in the conference. They haven't won more than five ball games since like the 18-19 season in the conference. Uh, But yet it still appears that the Sun Belt is going to be a one-bid league to the NSA tournament. No one's ranked. No one seems to be getting close to ranked. And now they're playing each other. So there was no huge, big Power 5 victories that could propel them into the top 25-ish. And yet you're going to have – someone's going to be left out because these teams are really good. How how does – have you talked to the players about that at all? How does the coach feel about it? Because that's just reality. And there's so much pressure – Especially when you, you know, when yeah. you're, you're a Bob Marlin at, at Louisiana, always seeming to go up against Georgia State and, you know, only coming up uh, big once. Uh, and that the whole season is based on not 
you know, the three and a half months of the season, but one weekend, uh, and it all comes down to that. And it depends on how healthy you guys, you know, how healthy they are. You know, Cajuns weren't healthy a few years ago. They came up short. Uh, yeah. South Alabama wasn't healthy last year. Uh, they come up short uh, and it ends up being disappointing. And obviously Marshall has one of those teams that could easily win the tournament, but they got to be healthy to do it. And, you know, it, to me, it kind of stinks that the whole season comes down to three, you know, three or four days. Uh, yeah. Well, Pensacola is a nice place for that to happen. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think you're spot on there, Dave. Um, you know, and, and that's the reality of college basketball once you get outside of the Power Five, um, you know, because there are always going to be, I don't know, six, seven SEC teams in there. And, you know, you'll always have a few right. from the Big Ten. And, um, you know, it, it really limits the spots uh, for, you know, for the, the group of five schools. And um, I think that's just the reality of, of college basketball. And I don't think, um, you know, these guys are focusing too much on that because that was always the same story in Conference USA too. It was always a one big li bid league. And, um, you know, unless, you know, a team comes w roaring out of the gates and, you know, launches into the top 25 somehow. And, but, uh, you know, I, I think the interesting thing for Marshall, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking here at the schedule, um, you know, the, the top five teams, Marshall plays four of them again this year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th they're at James Madison. They're at Louisiana. Um, they're at Coastal Carolina. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of these late season matchups, um, it, it's going to be exciting to, you know, to see, um, you know, how Marshall fares down the stretch because you're not seeing teams for the first time. You're seeing a lot of them for the second time. They already have some tape on you. Um, and I think that just ramps up the, uh, you know, the anticipation for some of these games. And especially when you get to the conference tournament, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the seedings are, are going to come down to the last week, um, you know, those Wednesday, Friday matchups. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of unknowns heading into that week in, in terms of seeding. And, man, I love the way the Sunbelt tournament is set up. The, four the top four seeds get, uh, you know, that double bye. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a fight scratch and claw your way to those top four seeds and um you know ought, ought to be an exciting finish to the year and i i know we got uh, about a month or so left so yeah a little bit more what uh what are you featuring here uh, in the herald dispatch uh, about the marshall thundering herd coming up well it's been uh, kind of a crazy news day all, all over the the athletic scene all right um you know here from marshall uh owen porter the defensive lineman uh, announced that he was going to come back so We've got that. There have been reports that, that have linked to Marshall's defensive coordinator to the job at Tulane. And uh, right. so lots going on. But, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to lock in some uh, some basketball stories. And I think one of my favorite stories um, out of this team isn't with the starters. It's with the bench. Um, people will look at the, the Marshall bench and say, well, they're not scoring. What are they actually doing? Um, and they're not scoring a whole lot of points. Um, you know, the, the uh, I don't think uh, they've scored in double digits you know, many games in conference, if any at all, um, from the bench. But uh, they're getting a lot of that defense from the bench. Um, Jacob Connor is, is one of my favorite players to watch. He's all hustle out there. Um, he really brings the energy. And, um, you know, I think he had uh, four steals against Southern Miss, maybe another three against um, Old Dominion um, on Saturday night. And so, I, I I look beyond the, the uh, scoreboard um, for a lot of that, and you know I think uh, when you're a team like Marshall that that can score the ball and and can play well defensively, it's all about the energy, um, and I, I think some of that energy coming off the bench is really helping sustain some of um, you, you know uh, Marshall's success this year. That's your new podcast, right? Beyond the scoreboard. Beyond. Right. Hey, Great that's a good. That's a pretty good name. I like Great that. All right, another time out. I want to, again, thank you very much for uh, listening or watching uh, Lockdown Sunbelt. Please subscribe uh, in YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. That's a big help. Uh, you can press the uh, bell button as well to get notified when we do drop new episodes. Uh, and that is a big help to the overall uh, episodes and, and myself as well. So we do appreciate it when you do uh, subscribe. All right, one more question. Actually, a couple more questions. And it's football-related uh, what happened with uh, Rasheen Ali prior to uh, the season uh, with the Marshall Thundering Herd football team? Yes. All right, I am going to ask you, I'm going to sneak in one football question. Kalen Laybourne, the Sun Belt uh, leading rusher, uh, mm -hmm. has moved on. 
uh, I guess, declared for the NFL draft. But yes. Rasheen Ali came back at the end of the year. How big was that for Marshall? Uh, do we know what went on? And if you can't be specific, that's fine. Uh, but we're glad that he's back on the field and, and really contributed down the stretch for Marshall. Yeah, he missed the first 10 games and led the team in rushing the last three. Um, so that kind of shows you his immediate impact. He was named the Myrtle Beach Bowl Most Valuable Player. I had a couple of big runs there, and um, it, it was it was an injury in fall camp that uh, that, that came out, and and I, I think uh, Marshall had tried to be a little secretive and protective of that information um, up front when it was first announced. Um, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of of information available. They just That's said, right. and so and so it seemed like it came out, and it was more of a well, lack of a better term, it seemed like it was more of a mental issue than a physical issue, and it, there should be yeah. a stigma with that, but there is. Yeah, and, and it, it was definitely a physical issue. And I think okay. the, the mental aspect played some part in it because Rasheen Ali hadn't dealt with an injury like that before. Well, sure. Um, sure. And and so, you know, he was trying to work his way through that. And I think uh, Kalen LeBorn was actually great in that because Kalen um, had a knee injury as well, too. And so, you know, Rasheen Ali comes back, plays with a brace on that left knee um, for those three games that he was there. Uh, but uh, just good to see him back to full health. Right. Um, and, and I can, I can pretty confidently say he's at full health now. Cause I watched him. He's actually running track at Marshall now too. Oh. Um, and so he, he ran the 60 meter dash in, uh, six, nine, five. So, uh, he, he was flying down the, uh, down the home stretch there. And, uh, there are actually quite a few football players that have done that. Uh, three of them ran seven flat or below in the 60 meter dash. So, uh, you know, having Rasheen Ali back helps that backfield and, and certainly, uh, will help going into next year uh, because there's no indication that, that that he's going anywhere else. All right, so see if you can take the sprinter. Let's see. Can he run an 800 to your 400? Oh, uh, he probably beats me. Oh, see, those sprinters <laughs> yeah. run out of gas. I don't yeah. know. You only got to do one lap. I, I, I've you only got to do one lap. I, I've never timed my 40, um, but I have timed 100 before, and I was at like 11. Um, a sprint. Yeah, so you, you know, just need you to jog and not die. I don't know. Maybe a couple, of, maybe a couple of years ago. A couple years ago, um, because I wouldn't have seen him on tape at that point, and uh, would be a lot more confident heading into that. But I've seen him run full speed. And I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I got that. That's the thing. Can can he run full speed for eight hundred meters compared to your four? So I don't know. That's maybe true. you could get him. Uh, see, he'd have a better chance in a mile because it'd be a longer distance for him. That's true. Uh, That's and true. so he, he would have more time to, to, to lap you. So yeah, we'll see. I, I, can, I can tell you that, that, that I would double his 60 meter time though, probably. <laughs> double his 60 meter. Okay. Yeah, me too. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> Luke Creasy from the Herald Dispatch. Thanks very much for jumping on Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. We will talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. Sounds good, man. All right, special thanks to Luke Creasy from the Herald Dispatch in Huntington, West Virginia, covering the Marshall Thundering Herd. Appreciate his time. We will be back with the Thursday edition, and we will look into more previewing. We will preview more of the matchups uh, in Sun Belt basketball uh, that is happening on a Thursday night. Once again, I'm your host, Dave Schultz. Thanks very much for tuning in to Lockdown Sun Belt, your team, every day.